Hello, good evening, good day, everybody, <clears throat> and welcome to us the Ask a Budget Show, episode one forty. I hope you are all doing very well. And before we begin, let me wish you all a very happy Diwali. As we know, Diwali is tomorrow, and I suspect that some of you must have celebrated Diwali a little early after watching the cricket match today, <laughs> right? So yeah, so I wish you all a very happy Diwali. And uh, I too watched the cricket match today for a change. Uh, these days, I don't watch cricket, but today I thought, let me watch it. and it was uh, certainly well worth the time so um, let's see who all is there with us i can see harry potter arsh the dragon emperor vivan shivansh shashwat amritan su joseph stalin abhishek challenge accepted r242 nilesh softwares gorov piyush rishav shetkari nivesh mayank pranay Sagar, Devanshu, Raj, Kalash, Gupta, Varinder, Deepesh, Swapna, Samarth, Priyanshi, Mazhar, Neel, Saket, Abhinav, Tux, Sharks, Aryan, Shubham, the Ox Boss, Ashish, Bhumi, Shravani, Vladimir, Adityanath, Vaibhav Mishra, Avishek, Sarkar, Shriram, Anjivil, Aprat, Aprati. Aprati Hat Singh, Akash, Nikunj, Alpha, Devendra, Divine, Akash, Prasad, Swar, Sundarya, Pankaj, The Guy, Shubham, Anahita, Shambhavi, Prerna, Subhi, Kasta, Punit, R T K, Ashish, Trupti, Jiga, Child of India, Nikhil, Dev, Cry Baby, Challenge Accepted, and lots of other people. Good evening, good day to all of you. Thank you for being on the show with us all tonight. So, <clears throat> let's take a few questions. So, ah. Uh, yesterday i did the uh, i i kind of rebooted the indian interest podcast and i spoke about a variety of geopolitical issues that are of importance right i spoke about that so some of those topics may be repeated today because lots of people have asked again lots of questions about similar questions uh, so about the same topics so some of the questions will be kind of repeated but yeah i am always happy to ask you uh, to answer your questions even if they are repeated because many of these things are very important and things are changing uh, geopolitically very rapidly right events are are going at a very rapid pace so we will discuss various issues today including geopolitics including history etc so let's take what is question number 1 where is question number 1 okay yes yes this is by chiching and rajat do share your trips when you come live again and how much anti india activity did you witness in lac would like would love to know your experience there so yes as you all know i was uh, no, i did not do any live streams last week because i was traveling uh, usually i am on doing some podcast or doing some collaboration somewhere but this time i was uh, traveling on my own so um a few months ago if you recall i did this i had this conversation with dr edward luthwak uh, who is one of the world's foremost geo strategists right and the conversation was mainly centered around china and the threat that it represents to india and what it means to the rest of the world right so we were discussing mainly china and national security from india's perspective in that podcast and in during that conversation he asked me whether i had been to arunachal pradesh and i said i have not been there and then he went on to describe the geography and the terrain of arunachal pradesh and, and the difficulties for the indian armed forces to reach the border areas and those things and i was thinking to myself wow this guy is not even indian but he knows my territory is border regions better than me so then i thought that i should actually myself go and uh, you know visit some of the border areas and and do some fact finding of my own and familiarize myself with the border conditions of our nation so that's what i did the the past week i spent a week or so in northern india mainly in the ladakh union territory right and uh, yeah so it was a very interesting experience uh, i did visit the loc between india and the temporary nation state of pakistan temporarily yeah i did also want to go to the lac with in between india and tibet where which is currently temporarily occupied by china uh, because of weather etc i was not able to actually make it to the lac but i was uh, in in the region right so um one of the things the first thing i had in mind you know was that i will not take any photographs of any military installations india has a lot of military presence obviously naturally in this region and i was very conscious i made a very conscious decision that i will not take any pictures or any film any video and whatever of any military activity uh, not activity but military installations or or outposts or whatever it is you know 
in the region and i did not do that i did take photographs i mean thousands of photographs of of, of the terrain of the of the region and all that and some of those photographs did actually accidentally capture some military activity not in the military outposts but on the roads and i will not release those pictures anytime soon maybe not for the next 2 3 years for sure uh, but my experience was very interesting so so let me share some pictures you know because a picture tells you a thousand words a picture is equivalent to a thousand words so uh, as you can see this is in ladakh and it's already snowing there winter seems to have come rather early so that's me and that's the the snowy region in the background right very snowy there and as you can see it's a very beautiful landscape i would uh, would like uh, it would be great if people would visit it more you know instead of uh, going abroad indians want to go abroad and see mountains and snow and things like that while well, we have incredible natural beauty within india itself so it would be great if indians would visit our own regions instead of going abroad and contribute to the local economy so this is just one one example right it's incredible natural beauty uh, siachen is very close by so you can see Uh, this is not exactly a military installation but it's just uh, uh, some kind of memorial right so it's about uh, the siachen warriors siachen is very close by for, for, to this to the, to the place where you which you see in the picture here and uh, this is very close to the lse where, where the enemy can actually observe you the pakistanis which who temporarily occupy some places or some some territory nearby so this uh, is a photograph you must have seen already in the thumbnail and this is me striking a very silly pose and behind me you can actually see pakistan occupied kashmir it is actually pakistan occupied gilgit baltistan behind me right and this is uh, the village of thang which is considered which is called the last border village of india and uh, <clears throat> this is yeah from a different angle all of uh, what you see in the background the mountains the valley etc the, the the pass between two mountain ranges all that that is all temporarily pakistan occupied gilgit baltistan that's what it is right and uh, the mountain peaks behind me in this picture are currently occupied temporarily by by pakistan so the mountain peaks behind me are pok pojk or pakistan occupied gilgit baltistan so i was over there and they actually have bunkers and and um, and uh, encampments up there in those mountain tops they are watching us but we they are not visible from from here and i also I, like I said, I took thousands of pictures, and some uh, later when I checked the pictures, I found certain things which are rather hard to explain. For example, this. For example, that. Right? Some very strange pictures that I can't quite, ex uh, which are a little hard to explain. This is the Pangong Tso region. There's a beautiful lake over there called the Pangong Lake, Pangong Tso. So this picture was taken in that region, and it is slightly, yeah, as you can see. So, ah, uh, yeah. so that was the experience i did not witness any anti india activity as such apart from the fact that the pakistanis occupy certain territories in that region west of where i was that obviously is anti india activity that is a temporary phase of our history in a in a decade or so it will no longer be the case and uh, the indian flag will be visible everywhere so that is in brief about my trip uh, that fact finding trip that i did to the uh, northern border regions of uh, india uh, i did not take much video because when you are doing filming you don't really experience the place right i wanted to actually experience the place and understand what the terrain is like and what the border regions are like if you want to do a, a vlog for instance you need a crew with you it's very hard to do a vlog yourself and then experience the place and understand the place so i did not take any film very little video i just took lots of photographs as you and some of them i showed you and that was the experience i could not make my way all the way to rajangla for instance which is uh, along the lse close to the lse between india and tibet uh, currently uh, temporarily chinese occupied tibet in the future i would like to do that in the future i would also like to uh, go and visit arunachal and other places as well so yeah this was a a brief interlude for me a small fact finding trip for me and it was very interesting incredible natural beauty i mean you should all go and experience it yourself incredible natural beauty and i actually went there at, at, at not the not a good time to go there from from a weather perspective because i went there in autumn right in the in the second and third week of october when winter is almost there it's extremely cold in the city of lay it's already in the night time in 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 early morning it's the temperature goes down to minus 2 or minus 3 or minus 4 perhaps 
and in if you go further north the, the temperature goes on to minus 7 already maybe maybe close to minus 10 now right so uh it's not a good time for tourists to go there the altitude is incredibly high the city of leh which is which is in the in the valley region in in ladakh is at an altitude of 3.5 thousand kilometers or meters above sea level that's almost 13000 or so feet above sea level which is incredibly high it's very hard to breathe there for a person who lives at sea level typically right so the the altitude is very high the oxygen levels are low are low it takes time to acclimatize over there and if you go further uh, you know, if you if you go to higher altitudes, like in the Pangong region, it gets even harder and, and the temperature gets even colder. So it's not for everybody. Typically, you would want to go there in April, May, June, July, maybe around August. I went in autumn, almost winter. So it was, but I enjoy the cold. And I was told to use sunscreen. Yeah, because the, the sunlight there is very direct, it's very harsh. But I thought like sunscreen is, is it's a cosmetic, I don't need that. And as a result, I've got this badly sunburned and windburned face, as you can see, <laughs> these patches of dark. Yeah, I, I kind of get sunburned very easily. That's what I've discovered. But anyway, so that's the kind of uh, experience that I had. That's the trip that I did to understand the border regions firsthand, what the climate, what the terrain is like, what the geography is like, what challenges our great armed forces and our, our brave soldiers face there all that i got a very good understanding of that uh, first-hand understanding and i would like to repeat that in other parts of uh, the border regions of india as well in the future so that's the kind of experience that i had um, and maybe in the future i may even do a vlog if i can i would need to hire a uh, you know so, uh, a crew for that i i will do that in the future right now let's go on to the other questions Okay, this is by Birkaran Singh, Neil Badori, and Avinash. What about you? <laughs> what about U.S. national security policy saying India is their major strategic partner? Neil says, did this video come up after U.S. declared its national security policy stating India is an ally? I think not. And Avinash says, then what about mentioning India's name so many times in the recently released national security policy, calling India an ally and so on and so forth? Even though we only call America a partner, is it a, just a bluff or a tactic or a signal for change? So I, I have said various things about the US uh, from India's perspective. And lots of people are now saying that I was completely wrong because the Americans have called India an ally in their national security policy document. And I, I discussed this yesterday as well. But let's discuss it all over again because I'm sure many people may not have seen what I said yesterday or heard, or listened to what I said yesterday. So the Americans did uh, release their national security policy document. And... In that document, they have it, it, they have mentioned India as a, as a major defense partner and and uh, and an, as 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 an ally, right? Now understand this: all warfare, all di all diplomacy, all geopolitics, all geostrategy is based on deception. It's based on not letting your enemies and your partners and your allies know what you're up to and what your long-term plans and objectives and strategies and tactics are. You should never let anyone else know what you're thinking and what you're planning. So if a nation like the US releases an official national security policy document, you cannot take it seriously. It is only for public consumption. It's for fooling people who are very gullible, like like the, the like many of the comments that one sees, right? And I, I'm sure lots of other uh, so-called <laughs> uh, geopolitics observers and commentators must have uh, been very enthused about the fact that America has called India an ally and mentioned India seven or eight times in the document. I, I see. First of all, and please understand, I don't watch any other geopolitics videos. I don't follow such channels and such uh, writers and all that. So I have no idea who said what. But I get the feeling, I get the sense that many of the other geopolitical uh, experts seem to be very happy about this. So I am not happy about this. I'm not, it doesn't excite me at all because any document that is released in public is only for public consumption. It does not reflect what that nation actually seeks and intends to do. It's all about deception. So if they have mentioned India seven, eight times or whatever, why are you all getting so happy about it? If they have called India an ally, so what? It's words. If you, I mean, have I, have you not listened to me enough? How many times have I said this over and over again? Words don't matter. Only actions matter. And yet you all get happy about this. Oh my goodness. India, India is now, uh, the Americans have called us an ally. They mentioned us seven or eight times in the document. Great success. Nacho. I mean, what is this? What is this? Why, why are people so happy about this? 
Look at the actions the Americans are doing. They have brought Pakistan out of the FATF grey list. So now any nation can invest in Pakistan without uh, worrying about uh, any sanctions from the US from, from a terrorism perspective, right? So Pakistan has now be, been given a clean chit. The Americans are giving Pakistan a half billion dollar upgrade to their F-16 fighter jet fleet. These are actions, not words. The American vassal states like South Korea and Japan are now investing big time in Pakistan. These are actions, not words. Words don't matter. There are so many other things. The American ambassador, there is no American ambassador in India, right? But there's an American ambassador in, 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 in Pakistan who recently visited the illegally and temporarily occupied uh, part of Kashmir, which is which is temporarily occupied by, by Pakistan. And they called it, he or she, whoever it is, called it AJK, whatever the hell that means, right? Instead of POJK, right? So they are all they, they are supporting Pakistan in all these matters. These are actions. When a diplomat issues a statement on Twitter and and uses a certain term, that's an action. It's not a it's not words words anymore. It's a, it's it's a signal of support. So when you see all these things, when you see the actions, they are all anti-India. When they are aiding and and and. Uh, arming Pakistan, that's an anti-India action. That's a hostile act against India. These wonderful words don't matter. But Indians are so emotional and so gullible. Yeah. That yeah, they said this, so now everything is fine. How silly can people can, can, can people be? Have you learned nothing from me? I just don't get it. I just don't get it. Why people are so, so gullible in India. So that's what I have to say, the, say about this. My, I, I can see lots of people. These are just three of the comments. I'm, I'm not saying they're all like all harsh or whatever. But I've uh, I'm just I've seen lots of comments in that you you know Abhijit, you are all wrong. See what the Americans have said now. See what they've stated. They've called India a major defense partner and and a strategic ally, and they've mentioned India seven or eight times in the national security policy. So yeah, Abhijit, you are wrong, and Americans actually are pro India. How silly, how gullible is that? I just don't understand how people can be so silly. Anyhow, that's where we are. I think it's going to be a long time before we Indians grow up. So please, please grow up, grow up. At least those of you who are who are watching, yeah. All right, next, Samarth and Rajat. Samarth sa <laughs> Rajat says, with the resignation of Liz Truss, would Rishi Sunak be able to take England out of its misery or will we witness another Sri Lanka for the UK? And Samarth says, will another clown Boris Johnson come back as the new PM now that Liz Truss has resigned? So my, my question, first of all, is why do we think that Rishi, Rishi Sunak is a person who's capable of taking in England out, out of its misery? Why? What do we know about uh, Rishi Sunak? He's an Indian origin guy. He's a, and people are so, so happy about that. My God, Rishi Sunak has a second chance now. He may become the PM. Who cares? Who is he? He's another nobody. I had said a few weeks ago that Liz Truss is a nobody and she will achieve nothing. And people were really angry about that. I saw lots of very um, angry comments saying that, Abhijit, who the hell do you think you are? Who you are? Who, who are you? Who are you to say that Liz Truss will do nothing and who whatever? Well, I have turned out to be absolutely correct. My my words have been, have I mean you know she's already gone. One of the shortest serving prime ministers of all time in the UK, if not the shortest serving prime minister. She's a nobody. Similarly, in my opinion, Rishi Sunak is going to achieve nothing if even if he does become the PM of the UK of England. And we don't even know if he will be able to do that. So even if he does become the PM of the UK, it will not make any difference to us or to the UK. The UK is the new Japan. Apart from Shinzo Abe, you had a long procession of nobodies who became PM of Japan for a certain period of time. They achieved nothing and they disappeared and nobody remembers them. The only person who mattered was Shinzo Abe and we know what happened to him. He was one guy who actually mattered. He was one guy, one Japanese leader who was actually a genuine friend of India. And I always say that there are no friends in geopolitics, but but uh, Shinzo Abe was a genuine friend of India. And we know what happened to him. So now th the same thing has happened to the UK. If you look at the, the record, the, tra the record of the past few years, the past, let's say, couple of decades of the PMs of UK, they are all nobodies. You had Gordon Brown, you had Theresa May, you had Boris Johnson, you had a few other people who I don't recall. And latest, the latest person was Liz Truss. They came and went, they come and go and nothing ever happens. The UK is, see, really, what's really happening is that the UK is now being administered from, from Washington. 
the uk is a vassal state it's a colony it's an outpost of the us it doesn't matter who's the pm of the uk that person has no power whatsoever no whatsoever and no decision making ability whatsoever if some people are going to be upset about that well cope because that is the truth and I'm, and mark my words whoever is the next pm of the uk is going to be another nobody and that person is going to achieve once again nothing of any significance so whether it's rishi sunak whether whether it's boris johnson whether it is what's her name swilla whatever the hell she is these people are nobodies they have no leadership ability whatsoever their only ambition is to put pm on their cv take boris johnson for instance his en- his entire ambition was to become pm a genuine leader has bigger ambitions a genuine leader wants to take the country forward and becoming pm is a step in that direction it is not the end goal the end goal is to take the nation forward and make the nation greater and to do that they have to become pm that's why they want to become the pm not to you know to to gain the glory and the prestige that comes with the pm position but to use the pm position as a means of taking the nation forward and serving the nation that's what real leadership is like these people like boris johnson etc and, and whoever else the swilla or, or liz truss they only want to become pm because it it adds a feather to their cap and it looks great on anyone's cv these people are nobodies there is no leadership quality or ability there right they only seek to serve the real master the real master sits the real masters sit in washington in the pentagon that's all it is so it doesn't matter who becomes the pm it doesn't matter at all nothing's going to change i don't see the uk becoming another sri lanka right the, um, the uk the, the uk is still very valuable it's still very useful to, to the us why would they ruin it they will ensure that there is no genuine leader who can emerge that's what the americans will ensure that no genuine leader can ensure can emerge in the uk who would actually care for the national interest of the uk and its people today the uk's foreign policy is an extension of the american foreign policy everything the uk does serves the united states it is made to look like there is democracy and blah 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 but it all seeks to serve the long term strategic interests and the national interest and the you know monetary and financial interests of the us that's all it is the uk is nothing but a colony a vassal state at best so they will not turn it into another sri lanka they will not ruin it they will use it as long as they can and as long as it's useful and it's still quite useful so that's what's going to happen but whoever becomes pm next is going to be an insignificant person whether it is rishi i don't know why indians are so happy about rishi sunak who cares who is he he's not serving the he's not serving india in any way whatsoever even if he does become the pm he's going to have no actual power so these people are insignificant we should stop wasting our time over these people froster says i think the new britain pm will be an indian because americans will try try to give india more reasons to be on the side of the west without giving us any real benefits this person froster is intelligent he or she gets it yeah he i mean the americans know very well that indians are extremely emotional indians like prestige indians like status as even if the status comes at the at the expense of india's national interest doesn't matter indians don't even understand what is the meaning of the national interest yeah so they may give, yeah this is a very interesting uh, thought that uh, froster has put forth that maybe the americans will make uh, maybe rishi sunak or maybe what's her name swela the next pm of the uk so it will it will so it, then there will be a lot of uh, pressure from the indian voting population for the indian government to become more pro west because see now we've got a indian origin uk pm but we will uh, india will gain no real benefits from it everyone knows that i mean not everyone knows that but you should know that that it doesn't benefit india in any way whatsoever whoever is the pm of the uk think about it there are so many indian origin ceos in the west whether it's google whether it's uh, what's it called facebook or there are dozens of companies right big corporations the fortune 500 corp- corporations lots of these ceos are indians what in what way does it benefit india in no way whatsoever and yet indians dance and, and, and rejoice whenever the one of these people ascends to the top post these people merely serve an unseen unknown and larger master so that's how it is that's how the real world works and this is what none of your geopolitical experts will tell you 
but that's what it is so i'm glad that Fo- froster has learned something at least from watching me and i'm i'm really glad to see that so yeah maybe 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 froster is right maybe the americans will will install an indian origin uk pm yeah to make uh, the gullible indian population populace rejoice and dance and then pressurize the indian government to become more pro 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 west because see the west is pro india apparently no it's not all right next question trojan horse says what do you think xi jinping's third term is going to be like do you think he will be even more aggressive i think it's quite likely that xi jinping will be more aggressive and more more assertive uh, the 20th national congress of the ccp has just concluded it ended you know on a very on a very ominous note with the public humiliation of mr xi jinping's predecessor hu jintao uh, hu jintao was in power for i think a decade in in china and uh, <clears throat> and it is under hu jintao's leadership that china experienced year after year of of uh, double digit growth of its gdp and then in 2012 mr xi jinping took over the reins from mr hu jintao and now 10 years later he has publicly humiliated mr hu jintao by having him by by creating the spectacle of mr hu jintao being physically lifted out of his seat by two bodyguards or, or security people and and pulled out of the proceedings of the uh, <clears throat> of the 20th national congress of the ccp mr hu jintao was later allowed to come back and vote or whatever but that spectacle that was done is something that that people will remember forever so yeah <clears throat> so mr mr xi jinping mr xi has uh, consolidated his power in the chinese communist party in the ccp in china he has created uh, he has packed the power pa- power echelons with hand picked candidates right uh, and yeah so his his hold over the ccp is more or less absolute right now and yet china is going through a very bad time now the economy is not doing well they are not even releasing the gdp figures anymore because that's how bad the economy is doing the belt and road initiative is dead in the water it's frozen it's not going anywhere for anywhere uh, anywhere uh, ahead yeah there are lockdowns lots of lockdowns in china again and again because now it looks like china is the only nation that's suffering from the coronavirus pandemic the rest of the world is is kind of looks like it's 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 gone beyond that but the chinese are imposing lockdowns repeatedly in various places like shanghai and so on one wonders why that what that is a case but that's what's happening right the chinese are struggling even now with the covid so china is not doing well china doesn't look like it's going to become a superpower in time soon because the bri is dead in the water it's not working anymore and they have their great hope of of russia coming to beg to them as a consequence of the ukraine war that also has not happened because india has helped help russia out by buying 50 times more oil than it was buying from russia earlier despite uh, american threats and warnings so russia has been saved by india russia has not been forced to go and beg to china and become a chinese vassal state so the chinese their superpower ambitions are well kind of uh, they're not happening it's not happening anymore it's not going to happen anytime soon so there could be problems in the days in months and years ahead for mr xi jinping you know uh, a chinese leader has to perform they have to show results that's how the entire system works it's a ruthless system it's a brutal system any chinese chinese leader who shows weakness uh, they, that person doesn't last it simply doesn't work even if that person has taken complete uh, control of the ccp or whatever if you don't perform in china as a leader you you're dead you're finished so mr xi jinping could get desperate if things go th- things keep on going bad right if the economy doesn't emerge out of its its downturn i mean things are going to get worse there's a food crisis there's an energy crisis in the world um which has been created by the created by the americans there there are these sanctions the americans have imposed on china the export controls for semiconductors and all that so the, so the chinese semiconductor in, industry seems to be finished right now yeah it's it's almost like a nuclear attack on the uh, chinese semiconductor and chip industry so now the chinese even if they try to control capture taiwan if the Ch- the taiwan is destroy those uh, those chip picking factories then, then the chinese will be left with nothing so it becomes even more difficult for them to to try and you know invade taiwan or conquer taiwan so the chinese are in a very difficult position 
and that's something that could make Xi Jinping desperate and make him aggressive and uh, you know lead to various uh, one could say ill advisable actions on behalf of china on the on the part of china maybe if there is a uh, a perception among the chinese population that the president is not doing well then the president may out of desperation do a gamble you know gamble the, a short war with some nation whom they could try to humiliate and that would bring back the prestige of the president right so yeah things like that could happen it's it's it's, it's a, we are living through dangerous times right now these are very dangerous times there are there are potential trouble spots all across the world mainly in asia also in europe you have the russia ukraine conflict that's that's simmering right now it's going on russia is waiting for winter because winter will teach the, the europeans a big lesson right the russians know that it's going to happen it's coming there are hard times ahead for for europe winter is coming and over here in asia there are all these 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 trouble spots you know places where anything could happen any time depending on the leadership there is the entire undemarcated border between tibet and india tibet is currently temporarily occupied by china right now china has the upper hand it's way more powerful than india for now yes uh, from a conventional perspective from a military perspective from an economic perspective and so on but india also is more than capable of defending itself when it comes to to, to china so there is the entire undemarcated border between india and tibet which is a flash point, a potential flashpoint there is obviously pakistan the rogue terrorist nation that is supported by the americans and the chinese as a counterbalance to india that again is a huge problem for the whole world and then there is taiwan then there is the chinese dispute with, with the japanese in the in the senkaku islands which they call the yao island islands there are so many trouble spots in, in asia so yes mr xi jinping if he gets desperate he could make a move on taiwan he could he could make a move against india he could try and make a move against japan taiwan is very dangerous for him because the americans have a very strong presence there the americans are still the dominant power in the world japan once again it's supported by the americans the americans have more than 130 military bases permanent military bases on japanese territory so it's very dangerous for, for the chinese to try and you know tangle with japan the japanese have a very very dangerous submarine fleet as well the chinese are really scared of that when it comes to india there are certain red lines the chinese cannot cross if they try something that they could pay a very heavy price for that as well because yeah yeah they their conventional military strength could be better than that of india overall but in the tibet region they are very much exposed yeah and uh, in the mountainous regions you know things are different it's not like conventional warfare mountain warfare is very different you know and in mountain warfare it's often the amount of training and the quality of the training that your armed forces have had and the quality of your personnel that matters because in mountain warfare you need to do hand to hand warfare sometimes and it's all about uh, strategies and tactics and also about the kind of weapon you have india has excellent missiles the brahmos missile can perform feats of what you could call almost magic and india obviously has the ultimate weapon that the chinese don't want to taste nobody wants that weapon to ever be used in war again but we have it and that's the deterrence so i think that it is possible that xi jinping's third term could be turbulent it could be uh it it could uh give us it could it could it could uh, possibly be more aggressive from his perspective and time will tell us but yes this decade is crucial for india for china for asia for the rest of the world we are witnessing this increasing bifurcation of the global world order the west against the east that's what's happening and obviously in the east we have all these problems the russia doesn't trust china india doesn't trust china and china doesn't trust anyone right now we are witnessing some sort of systemic cooperation between russia and china but everybody knows that russia the russians do not trust china and the russians have the world's largest nuclear arsenal and they have one of the most powerful militaries in the world we have not even seen a fraction of that being used in ukraine the russians are keeping it for later because in the future we they may need it so yeah we are witnessing a very turbulent period of world history this decade is going to be crucial in in determining the way the rest of the 21st century is going to go and right now anything could happen we don't know who's going to come out on top the americans are still the dominant superpower they are the only superpower in the world the russians are uh, the major asian power and the two other great powers are india and russia france is kind of a, a medium power and there are no other real powers in the world japan is a us vassal state so it's not an independent nation neither is south korea neither is germany neither is the uk 
France has a semi-independent foreign policy, policy and Israel, well, well, Israel also, one, one would have to say, despite the, the good relations between India and, and Israel, one, the truth is that Israel also, to a large extent, uh, its foreign policy is a reflection of the US foreign policy. Yeah. And Israel is greatly supported by the US, even though during times when the Democrats in power, uh, relations between Israel and the US are kind of testy, kind of troublesome, kind of strained. That's always been the case and in recent times, at least. I mean, look at the way, look at the kind of relationship the, the Israel and the US had during uh, Barack Obama's tenure, eight years as president. Very tense relationship, very hostile relationship, right? Between, uh, especially between the two leaders, uh, Obama and Netanyahu. Uh, but overall, Israel's foreign policy is, to a large extent or, or to a certain extent, a reflection or a continuation of American foreign policy. So Israel obviously is 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 a nation that is to has a special place in India's foreign policy. A, a lot of our interests align. So one would hope that Israel continues to prosper and do well and remains reasonably independent from the U.S. And yeah, that's how it is. So this is a very crucial decade, and it's a. It, I think it's going to be a very turbulent decade. I hope there is no war, but anything's possible. Anything is indeed possible. <clears throat> Bhavesh says, could we see a democratic government in China in the future? I do not see democracy ever taking place, uh, taking a foothold in China. Unless, unless there is a complete regime change orchestrated by the West, which seems extremely unlikely right now. See, democracy has never been a Chinese thing. The Chinese have never been a democratic culture. They've never had democracy. They've always had an imperial system of government from the very beginning. So if you look, look back at, at Chinese history, uh, China is about 3,000, 3,500 years old. If you, are, if, you are, if you want to be charitable to them, 3,500, 3,500 years old, that's how old the civilization is. And obviously, if you look at the archaeological record, it goes back in time. But the actual culture civilization starts around three and a half or so thousand years before today. And it's always had an imperial system. It's never been democratic. On the other hand, India always had the Mahajanapada and the Janapada system, which is a form of democracy. It's an Indian form of democracy in which you had elected kings who could be deposed when they did not perform well. So the people were paramount. These were republics. That's what you had in India. The Janapadas and the great Janapadas, the Mahajanapadas. The Chinese have always had an imperial system. Always. So democracy is not something that's in, that's integral or inherent to Chinese culture. It's 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 an un-Chinese concept. Right? Uh, so, which is why I do not see democracy. The, there, there, there is this... Uh, there, there is this band, rock band called Guns N' Roses, if some of you have heard of it. When I was a kid, it was a very big deal. One of the biggest bands in the world at that time when I was a kid. And they went on this long hiatus. They broke up and all that. Then there was this album they were making for a very long time. It was eventually released, I don't know how many years ago. And that, al that album was called Chinese Democracy. So that's a myth. It's a mirage. It's never going to happen. Yeah. And since it is something that's not a part of the culture, why would we even want the Chinese to become a democratic nation or culture? Let them be what they want. Why should we force something that is not, that is foreign to them upon them? If you want the Chinese to become democratic, it's like force-fitting a foreign alien concept on a culture where it doesn't belong. I am perfectly happy with the Chinese having their own system of governance, whatever it is. If it's an imperial system like you, like you have today, then well and good, it's up to them. It is an internal matter of China. In, in, international relations, we have to respect other nations and other cultures' internal matters. Don't interfere in that. That's the that's the foundational principle, actually, of the international system, which obviously the most powerful nations keep breaking all the time. But it's about mutual respect. It's about, it's about uh, non-interference in the internal matters of other nations. So I would say, I, I do, not, do not see this ever happening unless there is a complete coup and the Chinese system is broken down by the West and the West is able to effect a complete regime change, which is extremely unlikely. Even if they're able to impose a, democ a so-called democratic government in China, it won't last long because it's not something that is part of Chinese culture. So... To make it short, to answer in one sentence, I do not ever see a democratic government in China in the future. And that's fine. 
Okay, Yashwan says, what are the implications of Pakistan being removed out of the FATF grey list? Why is the US pursuing short-term interests? Doesn't it realize it's doing the same mistake it did in the 90s again? How should India tackle this growing adversarial nexus between the US and Pakistan? Uh, why do we see this as a mistake from the from the US perspective? From the US perspective, let's let's think, let's put ourselves in the shoes of the US right now for, for a minute. So the Americans are currently the only superpower in the world. What, what is the definition of, of a superpower? The definition from my perspective of a superpower is a nation or a power <clears throat> that can intervene militarily at any par, in any part of the world at 60 minutes notice. Within 60 minutes, they can intervene militarily. That's a superpower. So by from that definition, there's only one superpower, which is the US. They can intervene anywhere militarily, anywhere in the world at, at 60 minutes notice, more or less, right? The Chinese can't do that. The Russians can't do it. And India can't do it right now. Yeah. So the US is the only superpower. Now, if you are a superpower, you want that superpower status to go on forever. You don't want that to erode away. And so you may have, you may pursue certain short-term interests or certain long-term long interests based on what your long-term objectives are. So from the US perspective, they don't want new competitors or new threats to emerge on the horizon, on the long-term horizon. That could, uh, nations that could become a threat in the next 10, 20, 30 years. India very much fits the bill of a long-term competitor to, to the US. India's economy is growing. India's population is young, energetic, very bright. Very capable, huge potential. India has everything. India in the next 20 years could become the next China. India is very much capable of doing that. And the Americans, as a superpower, you don't think short term. You think long term. You think on a 50-year horizon and a 100-year horizon. And based on those calculations, you do short term things. Based uh, as long as it is the, the your short term actions serve your long term interests. So if you are the US, you want to ensure that India doesn't rise too much and rise too fast. And so to do that, you counterbalance India with another power when, the, when Pakistan is tailor-made for that. The British created Pakistan for this for, for this very specific purpose, to counterbalance India and to keep bleeding India and hitting India. Right? That's that's the, the only purpose for which Pakistan was created. And it was to, to serve the British geopolitical interests in the region, and it now serves the American and Chinese, to some extent, geopolitical interests in the Indian subcontinental region and in Asia overall. So that's why the Americans are playing these games. They have reopened the Cold War playbook. They always accused India of having a Cold War mentality. Well, now they're quite about that because they are doing the same thing. They actually have a Cold War mentality. We are now in Cold War 2.0. The Americans have uh, essentially tamed the dragon to a large extent. COVID was a disaster for China. You know, <sighs> COVID was a disaster for China. I mean, I personally myself have been guilty of calling this the Wuhan virus, but now I'm wondering whether it was really a Wuhan virus. That's all I will say about this. So COVID was a complete disaster for China. It derailed their bid for superpower status. Look at who it benefited. It certainly did not benefit China. It was a complete disaster for China. And it was great for the US. So that's what COVID did. So, so now, that the, now that China is more or less under control, they would like to control India. And that's why they are now supporting Pakistan in a variety of ways. And so that's why they have removed, I mean, it's the FAT of the Financial Action Task Force that has removed Pakistan out of the gray list. But all these institutions are controlled by the largest uh, <clears throat> power in the world, more or less, which is the US. So now Pakistan can receive funding and investments from various nations without those nations having to worry about the possibility of their in investments being used for terrorist activities. And any, we all know that they will anyway be used for terrorist activities because the only purpose of Pakistan's existence is as that of a terrorist nation, which is anti-India. So the Americans are pursuing their interests in this manner. Mm, they are also, uh, via their various vassal states, also supporting Pakistan via, via Japan, via South Korea, and in a variety of other ways. And <clears throat> there's a whole lot that's going on. So it's not a mistake from the perspective of the US because it did not boomerang on them. It did not hurt them much, right? It did whatever they did with the Pakistanis in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. It served the U.S. national interest. It was very bad for India. It was very bad for Pakistani people, of course, but it served the U.S. 
So it's not a mistake from that perspective, from their perspective. So they will do it again whenever required. So what should India do about this? How should India tackle the growing adversarial nexus between the US and Pakistan? The first thing India has to understand, the government understands this very well. But the people of India needs to under, need to understand this. India has no allies. India is on its own. India is, is doing this very delicate tightrope walk act. India is balancing various powers and various forces and trying to find its own way in the 21st century. If India goes to war with, let's say, Pakistan, who's going to help India? Nobody. If India goes to war with, let's say, China, who's going to come and help India? Not the Americans. And the Russians are currently not in a position to help India. <clears throat> so whatever India does, India is on its own. That's the first thing the people of India have to understand. The second thing, in the long term, over a 20-year horizon, the only thing India needs to do, I have said this a thousand times, I'm going to say it again, another, th another thousand times, the only correct course of action for India is to grow its economy. India needs to first reach the $5 trillion GDP mark and then the $10 trillion GDP mark and keep growing. India has the potential to become the largest economy in the world because historically that's been India's historical position in the world. The largest economy by far, by a mile. That's what India has always been. India has to regain that position come what may. And for that, India needs at least a decade of peace. So India has to somehow or the other ensure that the next 10 years, there is no big conflict that India gets embroiled in. No major war, no major conflict. Keep all the various forces counterbalanced in some way or the other and reach anyhow the 10 trillion dollar economy 10 trillion dollar gdp mark because as your gdp grows as your economy grows your military budget also increases correspondingly and as your military budget increases you gain more military muscle and as your military muscle becomes larger other nations become more and more wary of trying to get embroiled with you in any military misadventure because it would be fatal for them Right? So that's the only course of action for India. There's only one course of action. Now, that's the long term plan, that's the long term strategy. How to reach there? It depends. As the world changes, we will have to keep on changing our, our actions and our tactics. The tactics will keep changing. The strategy and the, the goal, overall goal, the policies have to be the same. But the tactics and strategies can keep changing depending on how the winds blow, the geopolitical winds blow. So that's what India needs to do. There's only one way to tackle all these problems. It's by growing. It's by growing and regaining our historical position as the world's largest economy. That's the, the, nothing else. Nothing can come, should come in our way. The, this, this is non-negotiable. That's the only thing India needs to do. And it's not easy. It's obviously not easy. It's easy to say about, speak about this. It's not easy to do. But we have the right leadership right now in position. God forbid if the leadership changes, we are dead. We're finished. Understand that. <clears throat> Okay, Samarth says, you pointed out that India is no longer in the US camp. Considering this, how do you see India-Japan ties and the future of the Quad? India and the US probably have this one common interest, so no impact on India-Japan ties. Um, India-Japan ties are changing, unfortunately. Uh, I pointed out that India is no longer... India was never in the US camp. But India and the US were coming closer together because of the rise of China. Now, like I just said... The Chinese rise has stopped. It has the, the Chinese juggernaut, the Chinese growth engine has stalled. The COVID pandemic has been a complete and utter disaster for China. Their economy is crumbling. They, they are not even releasing the GDP figures. The belt and road interface is, is, is finished more or less. It's no longer progressing. And the, the great Chinese bid for superpower status has been completely derailed. They don't even have the uh, Russia as a vassal state. It did not happen. India ensured it doesn't happen. So because of this, because the Americans have more or less tamed the dragon, at least for now, that's why the, the closeness that we were witnessing in India-US ties no longer exists. Now the, tri the, the relations are very strained. The relations between India and the US. These are very strained relations right now. The Americans are doing lots of things that are anti-India, primarily through Pakistan, also in a, in a variety of other ways as well, via their various vassal states. Now, what was the Quad? The Quad, whatever you say about this, was primarily aimed at containing China. The Quadrilateral Alliance, India, the US, Australia, and Japan. 
Now, it's essentially an India-US block because Australia and Japan are US vassal states. Australia is essentially a US corporation. It's owned by the US, more or less. And Japan is under permanent military occupation by the US. So it's essentially an in India, in India and US block that the Quad is. Now, since the Chinese, to some extent, have been contained, obviously the Chinese are still a formidable uh, naval power. They have a very large navy. They are still building more warships. They're still building submarines. They're still bolstering their armed forces. But because the economy is stagnant now, they will not be able to continue this at the same pace. So, and the Americans have more or less destroyed the Chinese chip making industry and they are doing everything they can to hamper the Chinese. And that's why the Americans are, right now it looks like they're pretty confident that the, that, the, that the Chinese have been more or less contained for now at least. Yes. And that's why the Quad will no longer get the same importance as it used to. Obviously, it, is, it still has a relevance. We still They still need, need to contain the Chinese and ensure the Chinese don't cross the various island chains in the South China Sea, the Champa Sea and the, in the Pacific Ocean region and so on. So for that, the Quad is important. The Americans are arming the Australians in the next 20 years, Australia will acquire US-made nuclear submarines and so on. So the Quad will remain relevant, but it will no longer have the same urgency that it had, let's say, two years ago or three years ago. But it's still going to be relevant. So India and the US, from the Chinese perspective, are still on the same side. India does need the US to some extent to counterbalance China. India can counterbalance China on its own using its whatever means it has at its disposal, but it does need the goodwill of the US to some extent, to a large extent, actually. So um, the Quad will remain relevant. Now, what about India-Japan? As long as Shinzo Abe was a big force, as long as Shinzo Abe was alive, whether he was active in politics or not, he was the biggest force in Japanese politics. All right? No matter what he was doing, he was the major Japanese politician, the major leader in Japan. No other leader, even if they were the prime minister or whatever, could hope to achieve the status, the stature that Shinzo Abe had. Now Shinzo Abe is out of the way. He is out of the way. He is gone. He has been assassinated. Now we are seeing a very different kind of uh, relationship between India and Japan. Obviously, India and Japan, the prime ministers meet, they have very good relations, and we all still have a lot of uh, common interests and all that. The Japanese are investing in India in a, in a variety of ways, the, the bullet train project and so on. But the Japanese are now investing in Pakistan as well, which is something they never did before, as long as Shinzo Abe was alive. So yes, we know that the Japanese are entirely controlled by the Americans. Japan is under permanent U.S. military occupation. The Japanese constitution has been created by the, written by the Americans. And the Americans have the final say, the last say in, in all major policy decisions of the Japanese government. Right? So Japan is controlled. It's puppeteered by the Americans. And considering this fact, there could be a downturn in India-Japan in, in, in India -Japan ties. We already see Japanese investments in Pakistan, the Japanese are uh, waving off certain certain loans, not waving off, but deferring certain loans to Pakistan. And uh, you're also witnessing uh, a South Korea-Pakistan defense deal. So we are witnessing these changes now. So there's going to be an impact on India-Japan ties and the impact will not be, may not be very good. One hopes that the a relationship between the two nations it remains as strong and as vibrant and as positive as it as it has always been. India and Jap Japan are like civilizational brothers, twins, whatever you want to call it. Uh, India has had a huge influence on Japanese culture over the past nearly 2000 years. Yeah. So civilizationally, culturally, we are very much alike, India and Japan. But in the past 150 or so years, there's been this Big, big winds of change in Japan, starting with the Meiji Restoration, the attempt by the Meiji Emperor to, to remove all traces of Dharma from Japan, which kind of led to the events of the World War One and World War Two. Then the, the Japanese came under American occupation, and now we know where, where it is. So there could be certainly uh, a significant impact on, on India-Japan ties going forward. Okay, Ahmad says, what's your views on Iranian kamikaze drones that are creating havoc in the Ukrainian capital, Kiev? Should India acquire some? Vaibhav says, why is Russia using Iranian drones instead of their own drones? Can Russia help Iran in their nuclear program? 
can russia help iran in the nuclear program russia certainly can help iran in their nuclear program but does russia want a nuclear armed iran not very far from the russian borders let's let's take a look at the map it's been a while since we used the map but let's do it <clears throat> so what do i mean by not far from russia's borders let's take a look at the map so we know where india is yes we know it let's go north north of india you have kyrgyzstan tajikistan kazakhstan then you have russia go westwards you have the caspian sea so to the west of india there is this temporary nation called pakistan we'll, we'll just disregard that and so india's western neighbor is iran now north of iran you have the caspian sea and to the north of the caspian sea you have russia russia is here right so iran and if you look at nations like uzbekistan kazakhstan turkmenistan azerbaijan etc russia considers these nations to be part of its geopolitical area of exclusive influence right and extension of russia essentially so the russians i am not sure if they want a nuclear powered nuclear armed iran a nuclear armed iran is going to have a mind of its own it's not going to listen to anybody else that's what nuclear weapons do to you right once you have the one ring you are a whole different entity you're no longer the same so um, i'm sure the russians can help iran in its nuclear program if they so wish if they so desire but do they so desire i don't think so i may be wrong i don't know what's going on in mr putin's mind in the in the minds of the russian uh, uh strategic affairs uh, planners and all that but i think it doesn't make sense for a nation like russia or or any nation to create a new nuclear armed nation not so far from its own borders right so that's one thing so that's part of that's that question answered now about the iranian kamikaze drones so yes it does appear like the russians have acquired a whole bunch of iranian shahed shahed drones uh, these are kamikaze drones these are loitering munitions they loiter for a for an extended period of time in the air and then for and then they strike and they destroy themselves but they carry this this uh, explosive charge this this munition with them and that explodes and that essentially obliterates whatever target they strike so that's what a kamikaze drone is the um, the iranians have been manufacturing this this good quality shahed i think shahed 2 or whatever it is uh, kamikaze drones and the russians seem to have acquired them and they have been using them on uh, on 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 during as part of their war against uh, their their special operation in ukraine including on the capital city kiev right in retaliation to the destruction or, or the attempt to destroy the the crimean bridge so these drones are very effective and their efficacy has been demonstrated in the in the artsakh conflict right the azerbaijan versus armenia conflict with that happened a year or so ago and the iranians are not the only nation that uh, manufactures such drones the turks have their own drones their own loitering munitions and the israelis also have this harop the harop drone which also is extremely efficacious and extremely effective it's it's been proven to work really well really well in 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 warfare in conflict and india may have acquired some of the israeli drones and india may have acquired the ability to license manufacture those israeli israeli drones possibly yeah i, I hear certain small bird telling me such something like that yeah so uh these so this is the this is the new 21st century form of warfare that's how it's done drones are extremely effective very efficient and very useful in warfare especially loitering munitions they loiter around flying in circles from almost aimlessly apparently aimlessly for 2 3 4 hours and then without warning this strike and they can fly quite high i mean depending on the on the manufacturer depending on the type of drone they could fly at a, a very high altitude almost invisible and then they will suddenly strike at, at a, uh, and uh, you know obliterate the target so should in india acquire some, india should certainly acquire such drones ideally india should manufacture its own drones home grown technology as long as that is not the case we should acquire such drones from friendly from friendly neighbor nations friendly nations like israel for instance so like i said i it is quite possible that india may already have harop israeli harop drones and india may actually have acquired the ability to license manufacture these israeli drones within india it's possible so yes one has to keep 
up with the latest developments in military technology, in war fighting technology, new tactics, new strategies, and one must not be left behind. And I am pretty confident that India is not going to be left behind in these things. India is now slowly, or rather not so slowly, becoming a major drone manufacturing nation. And these things are going to be very useful when it comes to war fighting in the future. Yeah. Okay, Harita says, I live in France. I've interacted with many people from many walks of life and from different regions of France. There is absolutely no anti-America, anti-NATO sentiment in France. They believe, the French believe that Putin is evil, Russia is the cause of all their troubles, including the energy crisis, and America is their savior. So why is the Indian media highlighting the micro minuscule protest that happened on one weekend in one place and making it look like there is widespread discontent? Why do they claim that France is close to quitting NATO? Uh, so I have not been keeping up with the news as it is shown on Indian media because it is distasteful. The Indian media has no absolutely no understanding of geopolitics and strategic affairs. Absolutely none whatsoever. If you see their analysis, it is it is ridiculous. Say ridicule. Yeah. So I don't watch the news. So I'm not sure what the Indian media has been saying. In case they have been highlighting some protests, well, that's what the Indian media does. It has no idea of what's really happening and they have no ability to, to really interpret and analyze what various events actually mean. And they often tend to blow small things out of proportion and make it, you know, f fit a certain narrative or perspective or whatever it is. So I don't know what the Indian media has been doing, but I kind of strongly agree with you that most people in France are pro-NATO and very strongly anti-Russia. And uh, as we know, uh, Russia and France have had their historical dealings, which have not been always very positive, whether you look at the Napoleon, Napoleonic era or even before that or even after that and so on. Europe is, has a very has a very uh, long and uh, rather fraught history of enmity between the various nations. And uh, so I, I, I totally understand that the, the people of, why the people of France would not have a very, very strongly or, or, not have a very good sentiment towards Russia. And obviously the Americans did liberate them to a large extent from the Nazis during World War II. So that is also there. The the Normandy, the invasion of Normandy from, from the beaches of Normandy, you know, and from there the, the campaign moved eastwards, liberation of Paris, liberation of France, eviction of the Nazis, all that. So yes, the people of France most likely, like you are saying, would have a very pro-America and pro-NATO sentiment, no anti-America, anti-NATO sentiment overall. There will be some pockets of resistance, maybe among the farmers or among certain people who would feel that France would be better off being outside NATO. There is, there is obviously a political party under Marine Le Pen, and she is of the opinion that France should leave NATO, but she obviously is not uh, right now able to win the presidency, right? So, um, overall, France is definitely going to be pro-NATO and anti-Russia. Or most of uh, the Western European nations are going to be like that. So, uh, yeah, so that is indeed, indeed the case. There will not be a very strong or any or extensive anti-NATO, anti-America or pro-Russia sentiment within France whatsoever. The Western European, the people of Western Europe consider Russia to be an Eastern, Eastern nation. They do not consider Russia to be a European nation. A European culture. They consider the Russians to be an Eastern people, an Eastern culture. So it's a cultural thing, it's an ethnic thing, and also it's a political thing, a geopolitical thing. So yeah, overall, I totally agree with Harita's assessment and her reporting that the people of France are definitely anti-Russia and pro-US, pro-NATO. And I don't know what the Indian media does. I do not take it, the Indian media seriously at all. They have no understanding of geopolitics. They have no understanding of what's happening in the world. Their reporting is, is cringeworthy very often. For the longest time, when it came to foreign policy and external affairs, the only, the only nation they thought of from the foreign policy perspective was Pakistan. International affairs means Pakistan. That's how it was until I think 90, until, until 2019, 2020, until the Galwan clash. And then China came on the horizon slowly. Nowadays, everybody is a geopolitical expert, but they have no idea of what's really happening. So I have seen the Indian media in action. It's it's terrible. So let's not take it very seriously, shall we? Yeah. 
Okay, Nitish says, uh, what's the question? Wouldn't it be better for India to be in line with America's interests and develop the nation as Japan, Germany and other nations did after World War II? Right, so, interesting perspective, interesting question. So, it would have been good for India if India had, let's say, aligned itself to a certain extent, for sure, with the US. The US was willing to to make India one of the five permanent members of the UN Security Council. Even the Russians wanted that. And there were at least three offers that were made to India. And the great Indian magnificent prime minister, the great magnanimous Sri Nehruji refused those offers and insisted that that position be given to China instead. That's a whole different story, right? So the Americans did want India on their side. The, the president of the US, Mr. Kennedy, he actually offered India nuclear weapons technology before the 1962 war with China. Had India acquired the technology, the Chinese would not have dared fight a war against India and try to invade India, which they succeeded in doing to some extent. So it would have been good for India's interest. But the question is, how far would, it, should we, have go, would we have gone with that? Should India have become, like you say, a nation like Japan or Germany? Well, Japan and Germany are under permanent US military occupation. That would be a horrible thing for India. Because then India would become... Earlier, we had the East India Company. Now, we would have the Americans. And then India's foreign policy and India's internal policy would become an extension of America's national interest, which would not be good for the people of India and the nation and the civilization of India. So, it made sense, it would have made sense for India to align itself or ally itself with the US to a certain extent without compromising on its core interests, on its national interests, its cultural interests and all those things. Yeah. So, it would have been good if it had been done judiciously in the right way. For that, you need good leadership, which we did not have. Of course, we had great, magnificent leadership, but we did not have good leadership. So uh, that's what happened. Now, we have to understand a different perspective as well. The people of Japan, Japan is an extremely prosperous nation. It's the most technologically advanced nation in the whole world today. Isn't it? The, the, the most technologically advanced nation in the world. Germany is Europe's um, industrial powerhouse. It is Europe's biggest economy, largest economy. Uh, the GDP per capita of Japan is incredibly high compared to that of India. And the same goes for Germany. Japan's GDP per capita may perhaps possibly be higher than that of Germany as well. So the people of Germany and the people of Japan experience great levels of personal prosperity, very high standards of living. And yet, these two nations are enslaved. These are not free nations. These are nations that are laboring under permanent foreign occupation. Think about it like this. Let's say you have a family of lions in a zoo. Lions. Ah, lions. These lions have kids of their own. One generation, second generation, those kids have kids of their own and so on. So these new generations of lions live in this big, vast zoo with a lot of ground territory which they can cover and there is a fence around that. So they have excellent standards, standards of living. They get fed regularly as much as they want to eat. They get great shelter. They get great wa they get water. They get everything they could imagine, they could ask for. They live lives of great safety, great, great luxury and no problems at all, right? And yet they are slaves, they are enslaved. They cannot go beyond the confines of the zoo. So yes, it's possible to enjoy great living standards and great personal individual prosperity in a nation that is completely enslaved. Do you really want that? That's the question you have to ask yourselves. It is, and, and, and a person who lives in such a nation will have all the possible, will, will have all kinds of options at their disposal. They will have great personal freedom. They'll be able to travel wherever they want in, in the world at a moment's notice. They'll be able to choose any career they want. They'll be able to give their children whatever they, the, the children want. So individually, each person will be very prosperous and very free. But collectively, the nation is still enslaved. Understand the difference between these two things. So yes, had India become another slave vassal nation of the US, maybe the people's prosperity would have been great. But India's culture would have been destroyed and India's freedom would have evaporated. 
Look at what's happening in Japan. Look at the cultural ero- erosion Japanese are suffering. Look at the cultural erosion and destruction of the culture of South Korea. Yeah, sure, they are prosperous. They have great standards of living, very high amounts of prosperity. And yet, where's South Korea's culture? And they have no freedom. The nation doesn't have an independent foreign policy. The nation doesn't have an independent military policy. South Korea's head of the military is a US general, is an American general. When it comes to Japan, all major policy decisions in Japan by the government, they can be done only after the approval of the Americans. This is not a free nation. So the question is, do you want to be prosperous but slaves? Or do you want to struggle upwards and be free? That's the question. From a long-term perspective, struggle is better. Immediate freedom, immediate prosperity isn't great. Because in the long term, your nation ceases to exist. Your culture ceases to exist. You become irrelevant and you become subsumed by the superpower. So that's the thing. We have to take a long-term perspective, a 100-year, 200-year, 1,000-year perspective. For us in India, 1,000 years are not a big deal. We are the oldest surviving civilization, the oldest civilization that exists on the planet, more than 10,000 years old. For us, a 1,000 years is not a big deal. So we have to take a 100-year or maybe a 1,000-year perspective. And had we aligned ourselves with the US the way the Japanese and the Germans have been aligned as, as vassal states, as slaves, it would have been the end of Indian civilization. Even today, as a free nation with an independent foreign policy, we are still facing so many challenges from the cultural and civilizational perspective. There are so many internal problems that are being created within the nation by outside forces. And one of the main thrusts of these outside forces is to uproot and destroy Indian culture and civilization. We are seeing it everywhere. So imagine had India been a vassal state of the Americans, like the Ger- Germans have been, or the Japanese have been. Well, the German culture is more or less the same as the American culture from a religious perspective, the same religion. But the, the Germans are fine. But the Japanese and the Koreans see what's happened to their culture and their civilization. It, it's, it's disappearing. It's evaporating. So I would say that it would have been good had India aligned itself judiciously with America from the perspective of India's own national interest in a way that benefited India and the US simultaneously without one nation getting more out out of the deal. So that would have been good. But had India become like Germany or Japan, it would have been the end of India. So yeah, that's that's the answer. Okay, Bhumi says, what are your thoughts on the new air base in Gujarat's DISA, which after its completion will reduce the long pending strategic gap gap of 355 kilometers between the Buj and Uttarlai air bases? And how much will it be a game changer in strengthening India's defense and national security? Okay, let's take a look at the air base in DISA. So, where is DISA? It's somewhere in the north of India, in the north of Gujarat, I'm, I, uh, I beg your pardon. So the old capital of Gujarat was Patan, this town here. It was once the greatest city in Gujarat. North of Patan, uh, you have this place called Disa. So that's it's, so it's in the vicinity of this town called Disa that the uh, new air base will come up. It's in northern Gujarat, close to the Gujarat-Rajasthan border, south of Mount Abu, more or less. So we have an air base near Buj in western Gujarat, in Kutch, right? Buj, this is Buj over here, if you can see. This here is Buj. And then there is uh, this Uttarlai Air Base, which I believe is in the Barmer region of Rajasthan, right, somewhere here. So there is a big gap in between. So this new air base in Disa will fill that gap. Will it be a game changer? Not exactly a great game changer, but it's going to f- plug a gap that is currently existing. So it's a good thing. So I'm glad to see that uh, these steps are being taken to uh, to strengthen India's uh, defenses and India's national security. Um, overall, when it comes to Pakistan, Pakistan is is not that big of a threat to India as as compared to China. But it certainly makes sense to uh, plug in any gap, to fill in any gap that currently exists vis-a-vis our air defenses and and overall uh, border defenses vis-a-vis Pakistan versus versus Pakistan. So it's a a very good step that we are taking now that our economy is growing, we can invest more in these, these things. 
So it's going to be in the long run a very good thing for India as long as Pakistan temporarily exists. Then we will look at other things. Okay, Daniel Nicholson says, I'd love to know if India's latest airport, where the first flight was completed by Indigo Airlines this month. Uh, so the latest airport near it- Itanagar in Arunachal Pradesh is a message to China, which claims Arunachal Pradesh to not mess with Modi's new India, considering the People's Republic of China always raises objections to any official visit to Arunachal by Indian dignitaries. Is India finally shedding its laid-back approach to the yesteryears of the yesteryears and being more aggr- assertive now, which is good? Okay, let's take a look at the where Itanagar is. So Itanagar is in Arunachal Pradesh, in the far east of India. So this here region is called Arunachal Pradesh. Let me um, bring in. I don't know the terrain map. Here we are. One second. Okay, let's turn off terrain. So yeah, that's easier now to see. So Arunachal Pradesh is in the far east of India and the capital of Arunachal Pradesh is Itanagar, which is over here. All right. So that's where Itanagar is in the context of the Indian geography. And and we are now constructing a new airport. It's almost done. I think the first flight has already landed, a test flight by Indigo Airlines. And I think this new airport is going to become operational in October 2022, which is this month itself. And then we will have regular flights to this place, to Itanagar, from various parts of the country. So it's a very good thing. So what does it mean? So any airport, any landing strip has dual use. It can be used for commercial aircraft, civilian aircraft. It can also be used for fighter jets, for military aircraft. Whether you go to um, places like Silchar in Assam, whether you go to places like Leh in Ladakh, most of these airports in the border regions have dual uses. Most of these are military airports that are also used for civilian purposes. And you will see various military aircraft parked over there or taking off and landing. You see that all the time. So this is a very good step. And, And the other thing I've noticed is that there is a very, very strong flurry of activity by the border roads organization in all our border regions. The border roads organization, the BRO, is working tirelessly day and night to construct the infrastructure, the the road, the, the road infrastructure in our border regions, whether it is highways, whether it is reinforcing the roads that already exist, whether it is laying better tarmac, better better tar roads or whatever, they are working day and night. And they are working in the most inhospitable terrain, in in the mountains, in the hills. They are creating roads on mountainsides and all that. So we are seeing that a very strong push to create this infrastructure in our border regions, which has been neglected for decades ever since uh, independence, right? Since 1947, India more or less neglected all the border states, did not create any infrastructure there. Whereas the Chinese have created very good infrastructure road and and rail transport infrastructure in the border regions. So India is now playing catch up. It's doing it very, very strongly. And we are creating, we are constructing roads, we are constructing bridges, we may be constructing railways in some places, possibly. And we are obviously also uh, constructing new airports and landing strips. So all of this is as part of the uh, very strong concerted effort to catch up with whatever the Chinese have done. And it's, it's, uh, it's a very good thing. So what does it mean? It means that we it's, it's not a message to China. It's about strengthening our national security. It's about strengthening and, and bolstering our border infrastructure, which obviously must be used by the armed forces whenever the time comes for that. Yeah. And yeah, it's also a message to China in, in, in a way to not mess with India. So yeah, India is indeed finally shedding its so-called its laid-back approach of yesteryears, and it is definitely becoming very much more assertive about its national interest now, which is a very good thing. Arsh says, "What is your take on the Indian Air Force's new branch, which will mainly focus on developing and working on modern technologies like drones, land-to-land missiles, land various things?" Uh, Do you think they learned this from Russia-Ukraine war? You were also saying that we should focus on this. Um, Okay, so let's see what the news says about this. One second. Uh, Yeah, let's put this article on the screen so that we understand what's happening. 
So this is a news article from this month itself, about a couple of weeks uh, before today. So India, get, uh, the IAF, the Indian Air Force, gets a new branch for weapons systems, and it's going to uh, it's going to span four specialized streams: surface to surface missiles, surface to air missiles, remotely piloted aircraft, and weapon system operators in twin and multi crew aircraft. It's a very good thing. So essentially what we are doing is we're going to save a lot of money and we're going to save a lot of effort. So what does this mean? It's going to save a lot of money. The new branch will result in a saving of more than 3,400 crore rupees due to reduced expenditure on flying training. It will unify all weapon system operators of the IAF under a single entity for operational development of all ground-based etc. weapons and so on and so forth. So it's a very good thing. We are finally going to do it in a centralized manner. There is going to be no, no duplication of effort, no redundancy. This is going to be a single uh, branch. Think about it like this. Right now, if you have a twin center fighter plane in which you have two pilots, right now, both of these people in, in the twin center plane have to be trained pilots. And they also have to be trained on how to operate various weapon systems. So the guy sitting in the front is going to be flying the plane. The guy sitting in the back, back is going to be manning the weapon systems. But both have to be trained pilots. Now, with the creation of this new branch, the guy sitting in the back, the guy who is manning the weapon systems, does not need to be a trained pilot. So you are cutting down on the unnecessary training. That person can be a specialist only in weapon systems. He doesn't have to know how to fly the plane. The guy sitting in the front will be, will be flying, flying the plane. The guy sitting, sitting in the back will be specializing in how to use the various missiles and whatever else we are deploying on the aircraft. And the guy sitting in the front does not have to worry about using the weapons. He only has to focus on the flying of the, of the aircraft. Similarly, there are certain such roles in combat helicopters as well and so on and so forth. So this new branch is going to train and specialize in only the weapon systems, which is going to be a very essentially a game changer for the Indian Air Force. So it is a very good development. Finally, we are reconfiguring the armed forces. We are modernizing the armed forces. It's a very good development. Obviously, the armed forces have to keep changing, keep evolving with the changing times. Yeah. We have to focus on efficiency, on, on cutting down on of unnecessary uh, expenditure, cutting down on unnecessary redundancy and all that. So this is now being taken up very strongly with a great amount of seriousness. It's a very good step. It's a, it's a very good uh, initiative the government has done and the armed forces are, are undertaking. It's very good. Uh, have we learned this from the Russia-Ukraine war? I don't think it's only about the Russia-Ukraine war. It's about how... The, the global military landscape is changing with the advent of new technologies, with the advent of more threats, different kinds of threats. We have to keep evolving. We have to stay agile from the armed forces perspective. And that's what we are doing. I obviously have said that we, have, we should focus on this. We should focus on streamlining and reforming the armed forces, making the armed forces a more lethal fighting force in a variety of ways. So yes, this is a very good step in that direction. I'm really happy to see that. And this is one step. We need to take many more steps in this direction, but I am really glad to see that this is happening. So yeah, overall a very good step. Neeraj Jangit says, in a recent interview, Joseph Borrell, representative of the EU for Foreign Affairs, said that since the Second World War, Europe has built the best combination of political freedom, economic progress, and social cohesion. These three pillars have made Europe great to live in organized society. He also said that most countries lack one or two of them. What's your take on this? And what's India's position on these three fronts? How can it be improved? So this individual, Josep Borrell, is a Spanish politician or something like that. He, like you said, is a it represents the EU from the perspective of foreign affairs or whatever it is. He's in some high-ranking position. And recently he gave this, gave this speech in which he said that Europe is like a garden and other nations are like a jungle. Right? And he said that Europe uh, has built the most perfect and most organized society that ever has existed. Europe, um, let's see what, what the media report says. I'm sure there is something we can pull up. One second. Give me a second. Let me pull that up. Okay. Joseph Borrell. What do we have to see about him? 
All right, where is Mr. Borel? Here we are. Joseph Borel apologizes for controversial garden versus jungle metaphor, but defends what he said. So uh, he says that the, he did not mean to be racist or it had no cul- racist or cultural or geographical connotation include uh, and so on. That's what he said. So he said that Europe is a garden. We have built a garden. Everything works. It's the best combination of political freedom, economic prosperity and social cohesion that the, that the humankind has been able to build the three things together. The rest of the world, he said, is not exactly a garden. Most of the rest of the world is a jungle and the jungle could invade the garden. He then referred to the EU ambassadors as gardeners and urged them to go to the jungle and and maybe, you know, reform the jungle or civilize the jungle or whatever and so on. So that's that's what this individual has said. So what is my take on this? We have to understand something about Europe. How did, let's say Europe is a, is a garden right now. How did it become a garden? 500 years ago, Europe was the worst of jungles. How did Europe become so prosperous? How did it make so much economic progress? You cannot have political, what, what, what they call political freedom and social cohesion with, without economic progress and a great amount of prosperity. How did they achieve what they call economic progress? They, the Europeans achieved economic progress by destroying the rest of the world. They, there were gardens outside of Europe in the past. They destroyed those gardens and turned those gardens into wastelands and jungles. And they plundered everything of value out of those gardens, including Africa, including China, and mainly India, and enriched themselves at our expense. That's how they were able to create their own garden, by destroying the rest of the world. Europe produces nothing. Europe is small compared to the rest of the world. How did the entire wealth of the world end up in in Europe? Through piracy, through plunder, through destruction, through looting, through genocide. And now they say that we are the best in the world. We have created the best combination, blah, blah, blah. The problem now, the problem now is that the rest of the world is rising again. And the Europeans produce nothing of any, any great value. And without producing any, anything of any great value, in the future, their economies are going to go down. And the rest of the world is going to rise. India is going to rise. China is going to rise. And once the European colonization of Africa ends, it still hasn't ended. Once it ends, hopefully in the future, Africa will also rise again. Africa has incredible amounts of natural resources. The African nations should be the most prosperous nation in the world. But what's happening is that all the wealth is still being funneled out of Africa into the West. That's what's happening. So when all these things end, which will happen with the rise of the East, Europe will go back to its natural status of being the one of the first jungles of the world. So uh, that's my take on this. What's India's position on this? India's position, we, we are doing economic progress right now. We are a long way away from regaining our historical position of being the great, largest economy in the world, but it will happen. Social cohesion, It we don't quite have a great deal of social cohesion right now. There are lots of internal problems which have all been created by outsiders. India and th- these are efforts that are still happening right now, actively, to create more divisions within India. And these are all being financed and fomented by external forces and powers. We know who they are, and we know how they're doing it. They're trying to create divisions on ethnic and social and cultural and religious lines within India. And this is, an, this is something that's uh, um, a project that is actively being conducted by them. So yes, there are problems when it comes to social cohesion. Economic progress is happening. It's it's going to take some time, maybe a decade or two, for India to rise to a, uh, to the position of one of the largest economies in, economies in the world. India soon enough will be the n- number two or number three economy in the world. It's it's just a matter of time, as long as there is no big calamity like a great war or conflict. Uh, so from the economic progress perspective, India is doing well. India is on the right track. Social cohesion, there are forces outside of India that are trying to undermine social cohesion in India right now. We know who they are and we know what they're doing and how they're doing it. When it comes to political freedom, India India has political freedom. The people of India have genuine political freedom. India is one of the few genuine democracies in the world. India is a vibrant, though chaotic, multi-party democracy. 
Look at the US. It's a two-party state. That's not a democracy. That's a farce. It's just one step ahead of North Korea and China, which are both one-party states. North Korea has a single political party. And when their leader stands for election, everybody has to vote for him. The same goes for China. In China, the people can't even vote. There's a whole different weird system there. So China is a one-party state. North Korea is a one-party state. The US is just one step ahead of that. The US is a two-party state. Yeah, there are two or three insignificant political parties that don't really count. These are insignificant political parties. If you want to make any difference as a politician in the US, you have to either be a Democrat or a Republican. That's it. There are some parties. Those are insignificant parties. So please don't quote that. I don't need that. No one needs that. It's Those are irrelevant and insignificant political parties. The only two parties that really matter and really count are the Republican Party and the Democratic Party so-called democratic party. So it's a two-party system. We, how, how can you call that a democracy? Who's going to represent the hopes and aspirations of the various minorities in the US? In India, every single minority, every single region of India has political parties, multiple political parties that uh, that represent that those regions and those minorities. Why are there no, why is there no political party in the US that stands up for the rights and hopes and aspirations of the Native Americans? Why is there no political party in the US that stands up for the hopes and aspirations and rights of the African Americans or the Latinos or, 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 or the Hindus or the Jews or whatever? Why is there no such system? Why does everything have to be force-fitted into either the Democrats or the Republicans? So this is not a genuine democracy. It's a farce. So India is far ahead in terms of political freedom compared to nations like the US or Australia, which is a joke. Australia is entirely owned by the US or, or nations like the UK, which don't even have a political, which don't even have a constitution. The UK doesn't have a constitution. The UK is a constitutional monarchy. It's ruled by, by, by a king. And you may say the king is a figurehead, a puppet only in name. Not so true. Not so true. You think it's it's that way. It's made to appear to you like the, the, the king of England uh, doesn't really matter. It's only a figure. He's only a figurehead. He's not quite only a figurehead. But yeah, if you want to know more about that, you need to do your own research. I'm not telling you about it right now. <laughs> I'm not going to, getting into that. So I think India is on the right track. India is doing well from the economic pro progress perspective. India is doing very well from the political freedom perspective, better than the West. From the social cohesion perspective, the West is trying to destabilize social cohesion in India. But we will overcome this, these attempts and we will come out on top. All right. Priyal says, can you please shed some light on the recent hunger index reports which had placed India on one of the lowest spots despite other countries undergoing economic, natural, and hunger crisis. Sanju says, "Why do? You, what do you think it looks when India ranks so low, lower than both the neighboring countries? One was devastated with floods. On the hunger index report, when India sent food relief during COVID pandemic and Ukraine crisis to so many countries in need, how can India rank so low? Is it a West conspiracy to show India in a negative light, or is there?" Or is there something that we as a nation are not giving enough focus? I have got a lot of questions about the hunger index thing. Some people are saying that India is not doing well. They actually believe this nonsense. India has sent food aid to so many nations during the COVID crisis, during during other crises as well. India is a next ne, India is a net exporter more or less of food, especially when other nations require aid from India. Nobody in India is suffering from hunger. The UN reports have shown that India has more or less eradicated extreme poverty. India has brought more people out of extreme poverty than any other nation in the world in the past day, past uh, roughly a decade. Right? So what is this entire thing, this hunger index report? First of all, this is not a scientific report. It was done in a, on a very arbitrary basis. The sample size was, was about 3,000 people, if I'm not mistaken. And they asked very, very vague questions in order to suit their agenda. So we don't have to take these things seriously. I don't understand why Indians take these things seriously and they actually start believing these things. Who are foreigners to, to decide where India ranks on whatever index? Yeah. Um, so what is the purpose of this hunger index thing? Is it a conspiracy to show India in a negative light or is it something else? The purpose of this hunger index thing 
of putting india very low on the hunger index the purpose of doing this why are they doing this they are doing it so that they can mislead the voters of india and make the people of india think that the government is doing very poorly and hopefully this will effect a regime change in india in 2024 that is the real reason they are doing this they want to undermine india they want to make people in india feel that the government is not doing well because indians still crave western approval and a western stamp of approval and western certificates so they will give you bad certificates they will say you know you're not doing well they will say the india the nation is doing very poorly and most people in india they believe this nonsense so the objective is to hopefully from their perspective overthrow the current government in 2024 and bring a weak government to power or maybe a government led by one of their favorite puppet individuals like i have said in the past there are lots of aspiring zelenskys in india i am not pointing fingers at any individual i am not taking anybody's name i am not even going there but you know what i mean there are plenty there is no shortage of aspiring zelenskys in india zelenskys is, is a nato puppet he's a western puppet he is not serving the people of ukraine he is not serving the nation of ukraine he is serving his western masters and it's resulting in the complete destruction of ukraine as a result there are plenty of aspiring zelenskys in india and the west would like one of these zelenskys to come to power in 2024 and how do you do that you do that by making people doubt the performance of the go- of the government by issuing these false uh, indices in reports and saying that india is doing very poorly in the hung- hunger index indians are starving to death what absolute nonsense so please don't believe this nonsense these are all lies and fabrications designed to mislead you the people of india do not fall prey to these manipulations and distortions and lies please don't that's all i say okay Vishnu says, "What is the geopolitical stand of Brazil? Because it is a member of BRICS, the Chinese bloc. Okay, and uh, it's counted as a strategic ally of the U.S. But the U.S. doesn't support its ask for p- permanent seat in the UN Security Council, at least through words. Why th- is Brazil the sixth largest country and perhaps the big- biggest economy in Latin America? Why is it unable to influence world politics and economics?" so you can't influence world politics and economics without having an independent foreign policy and without uh, being a major power it may be the sixth largest nation in the world but it from the economy perspective it's it's not a big economy if you're not a big e- economy and you are subsidiary subsidiary to other ma- bigger powers then you are insignificant and irrelevant so brazil does seek some in- okay let's understand the history have you heard of the monroe doctrine the monroe doctrine was the us foreign policy in the 19th century more or less since the 19 since the 1820s onwards so you had the napoleonic wars so understand this the americans broke free of the uk of of england in the american revolution they became an independent nation uh then you had a lot of french involvement in north america uh the americans brought the louisiana thing from napoleon for a very cheap price then they later brought bought alaska from the russians then they were able to evict the french more or less from north america uh, in a variety of ways then there was a great deal of spanish colonization in south america i, I hope you all know where south america north america is if you don't let's go to the map because that's what we do so let's take a look at the map we're talking about brazil and north america and the western hemisphere so the western hemisphere is right here north america and south america brazil is the largest nation in south america so the, in the ni- in the 1900 in the 19th century the americans had the monroe doctrine which opposed any european involvement in the geopolitics of the western hemisphere in any way whatsoever the americans said that we will oppose any european effort to influence outcomes or to colonize any nation in the western hemisphere when this doctrine was put forth in the 1820s 
at that time the napoleonic wars had ended and most of the nations of south america had more or less broken free of spanish colonization so the americans said that we will not allow we will oppose any further attempts by european nations to try and colonize any nation in the western hemisphere in the americas which essentially said that we are going to be the dominant power the dominant force in the americas and we will enforce this dominance militarily and the monroe doctrine did not put any limitations on to what extent the americans could you know influence things in the americas um, so that's what that's what the monroe doctrine was eventually you had all these weak nations that that emerged out of the americas the americans fought several wars there was the um, us spanish war as well which uh, led to the freedom of cuba and uh, various other conflicts uh, hawaii was annexed by the americans as a consequence of the monroe doctrine then you had the first world war the second world war the germans opposed that the british also opposed that but eventually the americans came out on top and all the nations in the americas essentially were subsidiaries to the american uh, national interest and american foreign policy as a consequence of this you had various weak nations in the in the americas including brazil now now brazil is is a large nation from the geographical area perspective it's not a major economy it's it's not a very strong economy uh it does obviously seek some independence it does every nation seeks independence every nation seeks to no longer be somebody else's vassal state and that's why brazil is part of the brics block i would not yeah brics is still more or less dominated by china but russia and india together can very much counterbalance china in brics and now more nations want to become part of brics i believe argentina also wants to be part of brics uh Iran has applied to be part of BRICS. One hears that Saudi Arabia also wants to become part of BRICS. So we are witnessing a global realignment of of the of the of the entire global world order. Uh, so the question is, why is Brazil unable to influence world politics? Because it is not a strong nation. It doesn't have a strong economy. It's not a major economy. I don't think Brazil is in the top ten of the economies, unless I'm mistaken. It's not a major economy. It's not a major military. power as well there is no major military power in the americas except, apart from the united states no other nation is a major military power and so on so because of these these factors brazil is currently not able to have any kind of genuine major influence on world politics world geopolitics or world economics for that you have to become first of all a large economy a major economy and then you also have to build up your own military strength based on the kind of economy you have and you also need to have an independent foreign policy right now every single nation in the americas whether it's canada whether it's mexico whether it's chile or it's argentina whether it's brazil or whoever else all of these nations are to some extent in one way or the other vassal states of the us and they don't really have very independent foreign policies and that's why none of them really matter from a geopolitical or economic perspective on the global arena right sambit jena says in the falklands war in the falklands island war argentina was the aggressor yes sir sambit jena asserts that argentina was the aggressor in the falklands island war i i think i've said this multiple times in public perception the person who strikes first is always seen as the aggressor the 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 person or the party that is the first to take kinetic action is always seen as the aggressor now let's let's take a look at the geography of the of the of the malvinas right all right we are at the right place so the so called so, so let's see where where the uk is You see where the UK is? It's over here, right? Can you see United Kingdom over here on the map? Yeah, this is the UK. Now let's see where the Malvinas Islands are, or the so or the Falkland, the so-called Falkland Islands are. Go several thousand kilometers southwards, cross the equator, keep going thousands of kilometers south, and all the way here near Antarctica, off the coast of Argentina, you have the Malvinas Islands. Let's let's try and calculate the distance in a straight line from the Malvinas. to the uk roughly measure distance from here all the way to let's say london it's 12 almost 13000 kilometers how does a territory how does a bunch of islands that's 13000 kilometers away from england 
How does it become part of England? On, 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 by what right does Britain claim that it's part of their territory? It's right next to Argentina. So it's see, we understand that Argentina, the population of Argentina, Argentina are immigrants. All the nations of South America, nation states, were created by by colonization and so on. That's fine. But let's look at it from a geographical perspective. It's very clear that this bunch of islands, this archipelago, should be part of Argentina. It's nowhere near the UK. It's 13,000 kilometers away from the UK. It's right off the coast of Argentina. So by all rights, it should belong to Argentina. And yet, it is under illegal and temporary British occupation. So the Argentinians decided to take matters into their own hands and they decided to uh, liberate the islands through military action. So they were the first to fire shots. And that's why this gentleman, Sambit Jena, is saying that they were the aggressors. When somebody is occupying your territory illegally for, for a very long time, and then you take military action, are you going to be, should you be called the aggressor? No, the person who is occupying territory illegally is the aggressor. And you are simply taking steps to, to seek justice and to redress the injustice that has been carried out. So in that case, you are not the aggressor. But see, that's how gullible and, and that's how gullible people are. That's how simple-minded people are. That whoever fires, fires the first shot is going to be seen as the aggressor, whether they're right or wrong doesn't matter. That's the problem. So it's very clear that the, the Malvinas Islands should by all rights belong to Argentina, not to the UK. I would say that the UK is, un, is, is currently temporarily and illegally occupying the Malvinas Islands. They need to be evicted out of there. And this is happening obviously because of the support of larger nations, of, of more powerful nations. I think we can all guess which that powerful nation is. Anyhow. So I completely disagree with this very, very simplistic, simple-minded statement that Argentina was the aggressor. Argentina was seeking to redress the injustice that had been perpetrated upon it by the colonial, imperialistic British occupation of the Malvinas Islands. They were simply trying to redress that injustice. They failed. And because they fired the first shot, simple-minded people say that Argentina was the aggressor, which is so wrong. Tomorrow, when the time is right, India is going to retake POK and liberate Tibet. If India fires the first shot, are you going to say that India is the aggressor? How stupid would that be? Think about it. Right. <clears throat> Next. Okay. Chiching says, what was the lifestyle of the people of the far east of India during the Vedic, during the Vedic times? How did they live? What did they eat? Did they have kings and queens? What was the lifestyle like? Okay. Let's understand where is the far east of India. Very good question. So when Chiching refers to the Far East of India, she refers to what most people still now, even now refer to as the so-called Northeast of India. The Northeast of India is what I call the Far East of India, which should correctly be called the Far East of India, which uh, comprises the various states over here, Sikkim, Assam, Arunachal Pradesh, Nagaland, Meghalaya, Manipur, Tripura. Uh, these are the various uh, states that comprise this region, right? This is the Far East of India. So the question is, what was the lifestyle of the people of this region like during the Vedic times? How did they live? What kind of lifestyle did they have? What kind of food did they eat? Did they have kings and queens and so on? Now, when we talk about the Vedic age, we are most likely talking about a, a time that that is about between six to 8,000 years before today, at least, maybe more than that, because of the dating of the river Saraswati, which is mentioned in the Rig Veda. In the Rig Veda, the Saraswati is mentioned as a very strong, massive, powerful river, roaring river, mother of floods. And the last time the Saraswati was in her prime was about 6,000 BC, which is 8,000 years before today, which indicates the Rig Veda was written closer to 6,000 BC than to later on. So the most likely the Vedic age was around 6,000 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 BC, maybe before that, somewhere around that time, a very long time ago, maybe 8,000 years ago, maybe even before that, or somewhere in that time period. So during this time, what was the lifestyle of the people of the Far East like? We don't know. There are no records that we have, and nobody has done any archaeological work in this region of any significance. For instance, how many archaeological sites do we know of in Nagaland, present in Nagaland. How many archaeological sites do we know of in, in Manipur, in Meghalaya, in Mizoram, in Tripura? Almost none at all. I don't know what the archaeologists and historians are doing in this region. Almost no work at all. So we don't know 
what archaeological sites exist there. We don't know what archaeological artifacts we can find from this region. And we don't know what the lifestyle was, was like at the, at the time. What we do know is that the region of which is now known as Tibet and, and the, the so-called Xinjiang, temporarily occupied by China, it was once known as Uttarakuru. This was in a time after the Vedic age, right after the Vedic age. At that time, there was no Tibet. There were no Tibetan people living there. This entire region was inhabited by Indian origin kingdoms and people. And so was Uttara Madhra, which is present-day Central Asia. So around 5,000, 6,000 years before today, there were no Tibetan people living in this region. There were Indian origin people living here. Even during the Mauryan era, where uh, the Khotan kingdom was founded by Indians from the Mauryan uh, era of India, Khotan, and, and so on. So it looks like the various other people who live there today, the so-called Uyghurs, and the, our good friends, the Tibetan people, etc., they came in later from further east, from further east. Uh, and we know that the most of the languages that are spoken in the far east of India are classified classified as Tibeto-Burman languages. Some of these languages, like the, the languages in Assam, are classified as Thai languages. So it looks like at some point in time, people migrated into the far east of India from further east, maybe from the Yunnan region of, of, of currently temporarily in China, or maybe from, from further north, from the Mongolia region, or somewhere else. We don't quite know. We will have to do a lot of research to understand the migration patterns and how people migrated into, into this region and, and, and at what time they migrated into this region. We will need to do archaeogenetic work, population genetic research. We will have to do archaeological work and a lot of such research, which will together help us form a good idea of when the migrations happened and how long have the people of, let's say, Assam, the Ohom people been, been living there, how long have the various uh, Naga clans been living there, the various, uh, the, how long have the Methe people been, been living in, in the Manipur region and so on, and so, the, Mizo, the Mizo people and so on. Currently, we have next to no idea at all because our historians have not done their job. Our archaeologists have not done their job. So unfortunately, I don't have the answer. Nobody has the answer. You will have some historians who will make certain claims, but those claims will be baseless because nobody has done the research on which you can make such claims. You go to the University of Manipur in Imphal, you go to the University of Nagaland in, in Kohima or whatever. I would like to go to those places and, and talk to the professors of history over there and ask them, what have you guys been doing? Unfortunately, they, they've been doing nothing. So as of today, as of 2022, nobody has the answer of what was the lifestyle of these people like. Uh, most likely the people who live in the far east of India today, whether it's in Nagaland, Manipur, Assam, Meghalaya, or whatever else, most likely some of their ancestors came from further east or further north. And some of their ancestors would have been part of overall the the western regions of india obviously it's it's all a mixed bag it's a it's it's a, you don't have a single line of ancestry you have thousands of lines of ancestry that's how it is so um the answers still elude us because our historians and our researchers have not done their job uh, so i don't know as of today no one knows what kind of lifestyle they had what they ate did they have kings and queens of course they had kings and queens uh, historically, most of us, us as in Homo sapiens, most most humans have always had the uh, monarchical system, kings and queens. Democracy is a fleeting experiment. We had uh, an indigenous form of democracy in India for the longest time, the Janapada system, uh, that no longer exists. Today, we are laboring under this false Western democratic system. <laughs> But historically, human beings have always lived under kings and queens. Some of them have been good, some of them may have been bad, but it's always been the monarchical system. So yes, the ancestors of the people of the far east of India would definitely have had kings and queens. And most likely they would have come from, most of them would have come from further east at some various points in time. And many of their ancestors would also have come from the west of the region. Which, uh, which is colloquially called as mainland India, which is not exactly a correct term. Anyhow, that's what one can say about this. 
Saurabh says, how many evidences of burial of selected bones after cremation were found in the Indus Valley civilization? What about cemetery bur burials there? Uh, the, were they first generation immigrants or original inhabitants? That's a good question. Uh, let me put something on the screen. Okay. Uh, this is something I had tweeted a long, long time ago. Not a very long time ago. I think 2019 or something. So there is this uh, paper that has been published and which, and I have summarized it over there. There is evidence that the Harappans practiced cremation. There is strong evidence that cemetery burial was limited almost exclusively to first generation immigrants. Hence, burials may not represent the Harappan population at all. And let me show you the actual paper itself, what it says. Where is it? Here it is. Evidence for patterns of selective urban, urban migration in the greatest Indus, greater Indus Valley region and so on. So it says that, um, what does it say? So essentially, if you read the paper, it tells you that it, the paper says that it is quite likely that whatever burials you find in the Saraswati Sindhu region may actually represent first generation immigrants to the region. And it is quite it is quite possible that the majority of the population of the region practiced cremations. Yeah, we do find burials, but those burials may represent first generation immigrants and not the actual natives of the region. That's very possible. Because cremation has always been the major practice in India, in, in funerary rituals, right? And we do find evidence of cremations in the Saraswati Sindhu region, pots that are filled with ashes and burned bones of individuals who have been cremated. You find that. You find a few burials, but not as many as you would find if, if everybody practiced burials. So it looks like the burials that you find could represent first generation immigrants to the region. Why would there be immigrants to the region? This was the most prosperous region in the entire world. The most technologically advanced civilization that ever existed. And the most prosperous region in the whole world at the time. Today, everybody wants to go to the US because it is so advanced and so prosperous. So in the old days, there was India. That was the Saraswati Sindhu region. So people from all over the world wanted to come, immigrate there and settle down there. And people from elsewhere would have had different customs. So after a generation two or two, they would assimilate culturally with the local population. And then they would practice the same customs. But maybe the first generation immigrants would continue practicing burials. And that's what probably likely these uh, burials that we find represent. So that's a possibility. So that's uh, what that paper tells us. And that's, I would say, a significant possibility. Does height matter for guys? Well, yes and no. I mean, if you're tall, you don't complain about it. It's, it's good. It, it always feels good to be tall. But many people who have achieved a lot aren't that tall and that doesn't really matter. So what really matters in the long run is what you achieve in your life not what your height is. There are lots of tall people who achieve no, nothing in life. And there are lots of short people who achieve a great deal. Uh, Napoleon was not a very tall guy. He was a short man. And I believe even Julius Caesar is supposed to have not been a very tall person. There have been many great people who have not been tall. What really matters in your life is how much you contribute to society. If you are able to contribute more to society than you take out of it, then you have, ha then you have lived a meaningful and meaningful and, and good and productive life. So height doesn't really matter. Obviously, it, it it has a psychological effect and you obviously don't complain if you're tall, but overall that doesn't really matter. What matters is what you do with your life, not how tall you are. You can't choose how tall you are, what your skin color is, what family you're born in, what nation you're born in. What you can actually choose is what you do with your life. So that's what matters. Your height doesn't overall really matter. So don't really get stuck about whether you're tall or short. It's not important. Archana says, 23 October is Diwali. Will you not burst crackers? I think Diwali is tomorrow, 24th October. Doesn't matter if it's today. If it's today, I think the whole week should be Diwali. Will I not burst crackers? I will burst a lot of crackers. It's part of our culture. It's part of a tradition. Don't believe the woke idiots who tell you that it causes pollution. So crackers don't cause pollution on Christmas Day. How is that so? How come crackers don't cause any pollution on New Year's Day? 
how come crackers don't cause pollution when there are celebrity weddings where lots of crackers are burst why do they only cause pollution on diwali what hypocrisy so i am going to burst a whole lot of crackers tomorrow i'm going to have a lot of fun and i invite you all to join me in bursting crackers and celebrating diwali the way it is supposed to be celebrated it's one day one day don't give up your culture don't give up your traditions burst crackers go for it so that's what i would say enjoy diwali and i wish you all a very happy diwali okay let's take a few questions from the live chat i am i'm sure there are more questions that i have missed but let's take some questions from the live chat for a couple of minutes mm. <laughs> yeah the maharaja's elephant says the uk holds air drills over scotland yeah well scotland is currently under temporary uk occupation under temporary british occupation and it will soon be liberated i hope so yes um uh, bobby says it's it's just the amount everything at once lighting up can cause smog i suppose not major see obviously when you burst a cracker it's going to give off some smoke some 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 pollution it's just one day uh when it comes to north india it's the stubble burning that causes the majority of the population more than 99% of the, of the population of the pollution and various studies have demonstrated this that that uh, that preventing people from bursting crackers in diwali has no effect on the pollution so there would be maybe a 1% effect it's it, it's it's nothing major it's just one day that people celebrate and it's just wrong to to <laughs> to force people to give up a, a, a tradition that's thousands of years old and by the way gunpowder was invented in india and we have various paintings that go back centuries maybe even more than 1000 years that depict the fireworks being used in diwali celebrations in india so i think it's just one day obviously one needs to be mindful of pollution one cannot do this on a day to day daily basis on a routine basis do it one day and then stop be disciplined i i i think indians are very disciplined from that perspective people don't burst crackers every single day it's one day and they should be allowed to do it and if there are forces within india of certain institutions certain government that are trying to prevent indians from celebrating their culture that is not the right thing and th th these governments should be elected out of power all right voted out of power i mean gunpowder was invented in india that is indeed correct gunpowder was in invented in india not in china look it up look it up i am not giving you any references right now because it would take me time to dig it up but it gunpowder was invented in india look it up do some of your own research learn how to fact check what i am saying right go ahead manjunath says is marriage necessary it's up to you your choice you want to marry get married if you want to live a life uh, without marriage that's entirely your choice who's going to force you i'm not forcing you it's it's a social custom it ensures there is no conflict in society when you have a couple who essentially stay together for life that ensures stability of the society and no conflict because look at the way the west is today good god there is there is no stability in society people get divorced after a year, a year or two there are childless i mean there are there are single parent families children who grow up without the without the benefit of two parents and see how society is deteriorating see how much strife there is in society how much crime there is in society and, and so on mm -hmm. so marriage overall is a good thing it's part of all societies it's always been part of all societies today there is this campaign in the west to to destroy the institution of the family it's not a good thing so overall i say i would say that ma marriage is an integral part of any stable society but from an individual perspective it's entirely your choice whether you want to get married or not nobody should be should force you to do one thing or the other it's your choice you decide the way you're going to live your life Shaheen says, "I'm Zoroastrian. I'm gonna, but I'm gonna celebrate Diwali with all my bro Hindu brothers and sisters as always." See, our Parsi friends, our Zoroastrian friends are not just our friends; they are our own people. They are our our close relatives, cousins, brothers, sisters, whatever you want to call them. So, thank you, and I really appreciate it. And we we love you all. <laughs> you are our own people, and we should all celebrate our things, uh, our our festivals together, and take the nation forward as it should. All right. 
okay let's take maybe one or two question questions questions can india win a two front war well what india can do mostly is ensure it doesn't lose a two front war that india can certainly do that is a, a, almost a guarantee that's almost a guarantee that india will certainly not lose a two front war because india has various tools at its disposal that can be used when certain red lines are crossed so india certainly cannot be defeated in a two front war in a few years india will actually be in a position to win a two front war give it some time and work hard to make india a 10 trillion dollar economy all of you together once we do that we're going to win a two front war if required if it ever happens all right uh ask me a good question one good question mm, roger says uk is paying 800000 dollars to hide mount batten's diaries why okay so i haven't heard of what's happening is it is it true or not that they are paying this much of money to hide his diaries but in case it's true i would not be surprised mr mount batten her battenberg he was a man of certain unusual proclivities that would be considered to be criminal tendencies today yeah look it up read up on his criminal tendencies and maybe he recorded his various activities in his diaries that would kind of expose his um <laughs> unorthodox tendencies and proclivities so maybe that's why they're doing it you know because he is somebody that's that's uh, kind of kind of portrayed as a, as a great member of, of 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 the nation or whatever right that's why uh what else do we have i think we are almost at the end of today um do we have any other good question let me try and find one good question come on one good question um <laughs> how can i be smart like you i'm not smart man i just i've just read a lot i've just read a lot i've always been curious i've always read a lot since i was a kid and that's why i have a whole lot of what people in the past considered to be completely useless knowledge but maybe it's not so useless see don't ask yourself how you can be smart like person x or person y or person z ask yourself how ca- how can you reach the full the maximum of your potential so you do that by being open minded by being curious by by always being receptive to knowledge most of us we stop learning after as soon as we are out of the education system that is a very bad thing you should never ever stop learning so as long as you keep learning you're going to keep growing and you're going to be smart so that's what i could say in brief all right my friends we are at the end of today's session thank you very much for your viewership thank you very much for all your questions for participating i wish you once again a very happy diwali enjoy yourselves tomorrow go burst crackers to your heart's content and i will see you in next week's live stream until then take care